Well, those of you who are in person, we've already talked a little bit. We welcome those that are joining us on our Uncharted YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us today. If you're joining us online, just so you know, the wind chill here in Montana is minus 25 today. So the, the amens could be chattering amens. We're going to do real Bible study today. What I mean by that is lots of scripture. And I, I want to lay out for you a doctrine. Don't be afraid of the word doctrine. Doctrine is just a, it's kind of a theological word that means teaching, okay? So I want to lay out for you a, a Bible teaching that is generated, really the one who first uh, reveals it to us in Scripture is David. Now when we last met together, David is hiding in caves. He has run for his life. He's taken his family to another country. He's dropped them off there. The Lord has brought him. The scripture says everybody that was bitter, everybody that was complaining, everybody that was a negative Nelly, everybody that was in debt, this is who he's got. He doesn't have the cream of the crop. He's got the worst of the worst. And this is who he's doing life with in caves. He's homeless, he's destitute, he's got no, uh, he's got no, that's good grammar, isn't it? He's, he's got no uh, uh, ability to earn any wealth. And uh, what the, God usually ends up having them do is he has them defend a, a, an Israelite community from the Philistines. And when they beat the Philistines in a battle, they plunder the Philistines and that's how they... That's how they provide for their food and their, and their clothes and, and more weaponry. And so they just are, that's kind of how they're surviving. In the course of this, Saul is still trying to kill David. And it brings us to two very, very insightful stories today. I first want you to find in your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, Oh, uh, uh, let me give you an overview of the stories, and then we'll come and read parts of them, because it would take a long time just to read all of the stories. So in the first story, Saul is looking to kill David. He's chasing him. He's got word that he's in a certain part of the wilderness area, and so he's after him, and uh, uh, Saul and his men, they're all split up. They're in a bunch of different caves in the mountains, and it just so happens just so happens, this is the work of God, there's no happenstance. David is back in a cave hiding and Saul goes in the cave and your Bible will probably say to relieve himself. You can't make these things up, right? So, uh, so he goes into the cave because uh, there's, no, there's no bathroom, there's no place, so he's in the cave. Well, while he's there, the guys say to David, God has given your enemy into your hand. You can kill him right here. So, so David doesn't do it. Instead, he cuts off part of his cloak. Saul's going to leave the cave. He's going to go all the way back down the mountain. When he gets down the mountain, David's going to come out of the mouth of the cave, and he's, got, he's going to say, I could have killed you, but I'm not against you. Why are you against me? I'm not against you. And here's the proof that I could have killed you. Take a look at the bottom of your cloak, and he's got part of it cut off. And so we're going to read part of that story. I'm going to bring out some truths with that. And then a short time later, uh, Saul's going to be after him again. He's going to be after him again. He's going to be trying to kill him. They're going to be uh, laying out. All the soldiers are just laying out, camped at night, uh, bivouacking. And David's up in the mountains, and he can see them down in the valley. And he can see Saul. And Saul has uh, uh, stuck his spear in the ground right next to his head, so he's ready for battle. And he's got his canteen there. He's got his water can there. And so David sneaks down there, and while he's down there, I think it's Abathar says, you know, I can kill him right now. I can kill him right now, and all this will be over with. And David says, no, we're not going to do it. I'm going to share with you. This is what the Bible study is about. I'm going to share with you why. And so David takes his spear, he takes his canteen, they go back up on the mountain, and then they holler down, hey! And he actually says to the general, aren't you in charge of protecting Saul's life? I, I could have killed him. And Saul is dark, and he hears David's voice. He goes, David, is that you? And he goes, yeah. He goes, look around and see where your spear is in your water uh, can. And, of course, David says, I got it right here. I could have killed you, 
but I didn't. Why are you after me? Because I'm not after you. So these are the two stories that we're going to be looking at, but we're going to be looking at something else. David is going to begin to explain to us a doctrine about the Lord's anointed. Okay? And uh, we're going to find it all through Scripture. I'm going to take you all the way into the New Testament. Um, but it's probably not a Bible study that you've ever done before. You've probably, no one's ever led a Bible study on the Lord's anointed to you. And David is the one who develops this in his mind. While he's going, while he's hiding in caves, he begins to put this together. Have you got 1 Samuel chapter 24 open? So um, here's how it goes. Let's start in... uh, Let's start in verse four. I've already told you the story, so we can just read bits and chunks of it. It says, so the men of David said to David, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. And so David, they want David to kill Saul. But David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him. Now, here, let's talk about David just a little bit, because some people get confused about this. People say, the, the scripture says, David was a man after God's own heart. And some people take that to mean like David never sinned. Actually, David sinned a lot. And some of them are whoppers. The thing that makes him a man after God's own heart is not that he was even more righteous than others, is that he was so tender when the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He was quick to repent, he was quick quick to confess his sin, and here's one of those occasions. He doesn't kill Saul, that's what, the, that's what all the soldiers want him to do. He just cuts off a portion of his robe, and just by doing that, the scripture says David's heart struck him. He, he felt guilt. He felt ashamed that he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord. Now, do you, in your Bibles, probably the first Lord is capitalized and the second Lord is not capitalized. So if I can help you with it, God forbid that I should do anything to my small L, my Lord, Saul. See, Saul's still his king, and he's acknowledging that. He goes on and he says, God forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. Now, that's the phrase that we're going to talk about today. That's the, that's the one that we want to delve into. What, what does that mean? And David's going to flesh this out for us He's speaking of Saul, remember, and he says, he's the Lord's anointed. I don't want to put my hand out against him because he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and they they didn't, he didn't permit them to attack Saul. Saul rose up, he leaves the cave, he goes on his way. Afterward, David arose, he went to the mouth of the cave and he calls down after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David had bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe is in my hand. For in fact, I cut the corner of your own and I didn't kill you so that you would know and see there's no wrong, there's no treason in my hands. And he goes on and Saul does his little bipolar thing where he goes, oh, you're more righteous than me. You're the best. I'm the worst. I'll never try to kill you again. And then he's going to try to kill him later. So, uh, so, but here's what I want you to see. I want you to see this concept of the Lord's anointed, and it starts with David. So this whole, this whole doctrine is, in a sense, David's doctrine, and it's David's understanding of the Lord's 
let's just say sovereignty, shall we? Uh, are you guys familiar with that word? Uh, it means God's in charge of everything. It's God's omnipotence. It's his sovereignty. It's the fact that he's the king, he's the ruler, he's in charge of it all. And, and so David realizes it's not my job to kill Saul. Is Saul despicable? Yes. Is he evil? Uh-huh. Is he trying to kill David? You bet. Is it David's job to kill Saul? Nope. It's God's job. And David recognizes that God was the one who anointed Saul. God was the one who set him up. God's the one who will take him down. I'm not going to do that. And it's, about, it's all about the Lord's sovereignty, but overall, it's about the Lord's anointed. That's the word that we're going to see over and over again. Flip over uh, two chapters with me to chapter 26. Chapter 26, it's just like the story that I've already recounted to you verbally. So they sneak down. Uh, they're going to uh, steal the spear in the canteen, but Abishai wants to kill Saul. You can understand that. Uh, it's very, very human response. Verse 9, let's just jump ahead in the story. They've snuck down there. But David says to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. The Lord's in charge of the day that he will come to die or when he goes to the battle and he perishes. The Lord forbid that I should put my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that's at his head and take the jar of water and let's go. So David took the spear and he took the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away and no man saw it or knew it. Nobody woke up for they were all asleep. It was actually a deep sleep from the Lord that had fallen over them. When David went over to the other side, he stood up on a far, far off on the top of a hill with a great space between them and he shouted down to the army and to Abner. Abner is Saul's uh, commander in chief. He's the general so he called down to Abner, the son of Nur, and, and he said, will you not answer, Abner? Are you awake? Wake up, Abner. And Abner said, who are you? Who's calling to the king? And, and David says to Abner, are you not a man? Who's like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over the Lord, your king? For, the, for one of the people came in to destroy the king, your Lord. This thing that you've done isn't good. He's, he's making fun of Abner. You're a terrible uh, secret service. You're a terrible bodyguard. You're in charge of Saul and he could have been killed. And he's, he's making fun of him. And uh, he says, as the Lord lives, you deserve to die. But you haven't kept watch over your Lord. The Lord's anointed. See the phrase there again? This is important to David. It's a big deal. And he goes, now see, where's the king's spear? And where's the jar of water that was at his head? And Saul recognizes David's voice, and he, that starts again with, "Is that you? Oh, I'll never. I promise, I'll never kill you again. I'll never chase after you. I won't. I won't do it until tomorrow." So, but here's what I want you to see: two times Saul has gone out of his way to try to kill David. Two times David not only doesn't kill Saul, he protects Saul from his own men who want to kill him. And he says, in this, this phrase to Abishai, look at this phrase again in, uh, in uh, chapter 26. Look in verse 9. David says to Abishai, don't kill him, for who can put his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And so he goes on and he says, so we're talking about the sovereignty of God. So God's in charge is the first part of this. And the second part of this is, I'm not. Now, I want, you to think, I want you to think about how much faith this is. Because he's still living in a cave. He's still homeless. He still doesn't have a job. His wife has been taken from him. He has a long list of things that could be immediately rectified if he kills Saul. But his faith is in God. God made Saul king. God set him up. It's God's job to take him down. Now remember, one of the things that we're doing in this study 
is that we are using the Psalms to, uh, to write along with the stories in uh, First and Second Samuel because the Psalms are David's diary. So let's, let's do it together here. A lot of, like I said, a lot of scriptures. Let's start with Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Give you a moment to get there. Psalms chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. David's the writer. Why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves uh, up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now he's going to start to flesh out this doctrine. Okay, so what we saw was it's his own actions. It's the faith of his own actions. I'm not going to kill Saul. If I kill Saul, I am guilty of becoming like Saul. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to stoop to his level. God's in charge of all of this. So God anointed me and he made me king. So God knows the time when I'm going to be king. God anointed Saul. God set him up. God can take him down. So he's talking here about those who work against his anointed. Do note, however, that probably in your Bible, that is a capital A on your anointed. And we're going to talk about what that means here in just a little bit. Go to chapter 20, still in Psalms. We're going to stay in Psalms here for just a little bit. Go to chapter 20. Remember uh, Sunday, I gave you a verse that I pray all the time, Psalm 50, 15. Call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Here's another one just like it. Psalm chapter 20, verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout with joy over your salvation. In the name of our God, set up banners. And may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know, he says in verse 6, that the Lord saves his anointed. Now David here is really speaking of himself. And Saul's after him. Saul's trying to kill him. So David has come to some conclusions here. He's, David's building this doctrine, right? So the first thing he figures out is, I, I shouldn't kill Saul. Saul belongs to the Lord. The second thing he realizes is, because David has also been anointed by Samuel, David realizes, wait a second, I belong to the Lord. I am God's anointed now I know God's going to take care of me because I am the Lord's anointed. Let's go all the way to Psalm 84. Now this particular psalm is not David's, but it builds on this doctrine of the Lord's anointed and uh, let's begin, uh, let's just begin in verse 7. So they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. This, there's, a, there's a protection that goes with being God's anointed. You're, you're anointed by God. You're in the care of God. You're doing the work of God. And, and that's what we see here. One last one. Go to Psalm 105. There's more than this, but we'd just run out of time if we looked at them all. And this one's really, really important. Now, one of the things that you read in the Psalms all the time is that the psalmist will just recite some history. And this is one of those occasions where they're reciting the history of uh, Jacob and Israel, how they went to Egypt and how God brought them back out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and they had man in the wilderness and they're telling all of this story. So we're going to start kind of in the middle of uh, all of that. So let's start in verse 12. Uh, Psalm 105, verse 12. So when they were few in number, talking about Jacob's family, when they were few in number of little account and sojourners, that is, they didn't really have a place to live, sojourners enter it, wandering from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another people, God allowed no one to oppress them. 
he actually rebuked kings on their account, saying, and here's a quotation, touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Now, uh, here's what's interesting. Uh, you can't find that phrase in your Bible. So David is, he's quoting a document that he has that we don't have. Are you following with me? So a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of documents that got lost in history, they've been destroyed. Uh, every now and then, archaeologists will find some of them. Now, he's not, he's, he's not quoting some scripture that got lost. All the, everything that God intended for you and I to have for scripture is all preserved. But when David quotes it, follow my reasoning, he's quoting something we don't have. But as soon as David quotes it in our scripture, it becomes scripture. Are you with me? So even though you say, well, where's that from? I don't know. But as soon as David says it here, it's scripture to us. It's truth to us. So let's look at the phrase again that is truth to us. Verse 15, touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets. Here he's using prophets and anointed ones synonymously. Do my prophets no harm. And so there's another there's, there's another level here that David's going to figure out, and that is that you shouldn't harm. See, this comes right out of the caves. You shouldn't harm God's anointed. And I put it in red because that's a big one, all right? So this is a teaching that doesn't appear. You don't find it with Moses. You don't find it with Samuel. David is the one who fleshes it out. Where does David come to understand this truth from God? In caves, running for his life. Saul comes in, he's got a chance to kill him, and he's like, that would be wrong. It would be wrong because he's the Lord's anointed. God's in charge of Saul. I'm not in charge of Saul, God's in charge of Saul. And, it, and he does it more than once. In fact, his, his little uh, mockery of Abner is, Abner, you're in charge of, of the Lord's anointed and you're sleeping on the job. You deserve to die because you haven't taken seriously what it means to protect the Lord's anointed. Now, this, this doctrine is going to be used prophetically. Find Isaiah 61. Still lots of scripture left. Don't, don't get tired. Don't get Bible, short Bible attentions deficit syndrome on me. Stay with me. Isaiah 61. We're quite a few years after David now. But the idea of anointing now is going to become a part of Hebrew life. It's going to be, it's going to be something that the Hebrew mind begins to understand because of David, and there is an understanding uh, that the Lord's anointed is not a regular guy. This is somebody that we understand to be a different kind of person. Psalm 61, maybe you'll recognize this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, upon me because the Lord has, what's the word? Say it out loud. Here we go. So, by the way, this is, how you can, this is how you can study your Bible. You can just get out a concordance and you can look up anointed and start to find everywhere where it is. This is a famous passage because uh, here uh, Isaiah the prophet is actually not speaking of himself. He's prophesying of an anointed one who's yet to come. What will the anointed one do? He says, God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And so we now have this from Isaiah. It's, it, it is the work of Isaiah, but not really. It's really a prophetic work of an anointed one 
who will come. Isaiah is not the only one to talk about a future anointed one. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. So you're in Isaiah, keep going to the back of your Bible. You got major prophets and minor prophets. I used to think that the, meant the major prophets were more important and the minor, minor prophets were least important. I now know the truth of it. The major prophets preached longer sermons. The minor prophets preached shorter sermons. So you want a pastor who's a minor prophet. That's who you want. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, is talking about the end days. As he talks about the end days, he actually is going to give us the ability to figure out really, really close when some of those things happen. So you got chapter 9 open, and let's just start in verse 24. I know it's right in the middle of a thought, but we're not really here to count days. We're really here to look at the prophecy about the anointed one. So he says, 70 weeks, I'm in verse 24 of chapter 9, Daniel 9, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And you say to yourself, why does God wait? Why is, why is God waiting to send his son back? Well, here are three reasons right here. Number one, to finish transgression. Number two, to put an end to sin. And number three, to atone for iniquity. Number four, to bring everlasting righteousness. He continues to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of, and here your Bible probably says of an anointed one, it really would be better translated the anointed one. And this is one of those places where the, the A and anointed should be capitalized to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks and then 62 weeks that happen again. Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, it means after the seven and the 62 weeks, the 69 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off. Now, we're not going to study this here this morning, but, but the time from uh, Xerxes' uh, decree to rebuild Jerusalem, that time all the way to the cross. What do you, what, what do you, anybody here want to take a shot? What it is? It's, it's 483 years. Which by the way is 69 weeks of years. So who is the anointed one. Now we take this teaching of David where David begins to recognize God's the one who sets one man up as king and takes down another. Now we come to not just an anointed one, we come to the anointed one. Turn with me to Luke chapter four. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter four. How are you doing with all the Bible? Are you doing okay? Good. It's always good to have a Bible. I always, I, want, I always want a Bible I can write in and make notes in. If you got like your grandmother's Bible and it's really, really treasure to you, you won't write in it, then put it somewhere safe. Get one you can write in, mark in, study, underline, so you can start to put these kind of things together for yourself. So Luke chapter 4, um, Jesus has uh, left his hometown. He's gone all around the countryside and he's done all kinds of miracles and everybody from his hometown has heard about it. And they can't believe it. They're saying to each other, Jesus, Jesus, the kid that lived down the street, Joseph and Mary's boy, Jesus, he's, he's doing all these miracles? No, I can't believe it. And so he finally returns to his hometown and that's the story that we're now about to read. Chapter four, Let's begin in verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus, the scripture says, came back to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
And as was his custom, stop right there. Let me give you just a little something for free. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus had habits? It, it tells us right here, as was his habit, as was his custom. Everybody on the planet has habits. The question is not whether or not you have habits. The question is whether do you have good habits or bad habits. How do you break bad habits? With good habits. You can't break bad habits by gritting your teeth and going, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Oh, I'm going to do it. Give me that chocolate. Right? And you guys know that I always use chocolate because it makes you giggle because if I used your real sin, then you wouldn't giggle. So how do you beat bad habits? You don't beat bad habits by just thinking, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Because even if you don't do it, the bad habit still completely dominates your mind because you have to spend all your time thinking, I'm not going to do it. What if you just didn't do it and you didn't even think about not doing it? What if you beat a bad habit and the way you beat it was you just went, huh, I hadn't even thought about that for like three days. How do you do that? With good habits. You start good habits. Good habits fill your time. They fill your thinking. And you don't have time to think about the bad habits. That is not my Bible study. That's just for free. Okay. The scripture says that Jesus, as was his habit, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. By the way, and what is, the, what is one of the good habits? Joining the people of God. So he goes to the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found a place. Now, here's something that you probably don't know because you're not Jew, you're not Hebrew, and maybe you haven't ever been in a synagogue, but all the synagogues in the whole world all read the same scriptures on the same days. They, they have a reading plan. The ancient rabbis came up with a reading plan whereby everybody would read a same passage on the same day in all the synagogues of the whole world. So Jesus happens to be in Nazareth on this day. Remember, there's no happenstance with God. When the reading plan called for Isaiah 61. So Jesus stands up and he reads the passage that you and I have already read. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. There's our Bible study. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. All the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And so he said to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So we discover that Jesus is not an anointed one. He's the anointed one. And... We find it, we find Jesus saying himself, this is me from Isaiah 61. And then Daniel proves it from Daniel chapter 9, when Jesus is sent to the cross. He is the anointed one. So, do you want to hear something unusual? There's still a reading plan in synagogues to this day. Except a couple portions of Isaiah have been eliminated from the annual reading plan. The first portion of Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 53. Because Isaiah 53 is clearly Jesus. You can't read Isaiah 53. You, you You don't know anything about the Bible. You read Isaiah 53, you go, oh, this is Jesus. So those are no longer in the annual reading plan for Jews to this very day. Now, 
this is great, this is glorious, this is God, this is Jesus. We find it in the Old Testament. David starts this doctrine where he won't kill Saul because he says, this is the Lord's anointed. You can't put your hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. By the way, so can you put your hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? No. So all we have sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus is the one who goes to the cross for us so that our sins can be forgiven. But out of this, there's going to become two New Testament doctrines about our everyday life. Because what you have is, you have, a whole, you have thousands of years of Old Testament, you got 33 years of Jesus, and now you already have 2,000 years of New Testament. So what does it mean to us in our everyday lives? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to evolve with this, is what I guess I want to say. We're going to, this doctrine is going to, it's going to grow with us. Because you have these certain, I'm sorry to use a big word, dispensations. You have these certain periods of time in scripture that are, that are different from each other. When David is alive, uh, Jesus hasn't done his work yet. So David's understanding, David begins to build his understanding of the Lord's anointed in caves while Saul's trying to kill him, but it becomes a part of his doctrine. So much so that later he's a part of the prophecy. Remember it when I pointed it out in uh, the Psalms, the anointed one becomes a part of the prophecy that Jesus is going to come. Jesus comes and he does that work. Second Corinthians chapter one, second Corinthians chapter one, let me begin in verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. So here's what that verse means. If you're reading anywhere in the Bible and you're like, I don't think I exactly know what this means, then just try to figure out how to get from that verse to Jesus. And when you get there, there's a really good chance you actually figure out what that verse means. All the scripture finds its yes in Jesus. He continues and he says, that's why it is through Jesus that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Do you see all the times when I make you say amen, it's actually biblical and you're out there being disobedient and I have to help you. So say amen. amen. There we go. So this is why we utter our amen to God for his glory. By the way, that's what an amen is. It means, it means so be it. This is for God's glory. Verse 21. And it is God who, and, and there's actually five things in this verse. We'll come back and, and we'll take them apart after we read it. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has, what's the word? Say it out loud anointed, but now it's not Jesus. It's us. Now God has anointed us and he has put his seal on us and he has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This is where it gets really, really fun. Saul was God's anointed. There's, there's someone calling now about the anointing. Saul was God's anointed. David figures it out. He starts to develop this truth from God. David God is God's anointed. We see all that becomes Jesus is God's anointed. But now the new, the general, there's a general sense. I'm going to use the word general. There's a general sense in which all of us who have given our lives to Christ are anointed. If you're here, and you've asked for the forgiveness of sins, and you've asked Jesus Christ to forgive you, God doesn't just save you and then go, okay, you're on your own, good luck, I'll see you when you get to heaven. And there's a lot of Christians who live that way. There's a lot of Christians, they're just grinding out their life, trying to do the best they can, as if they have no Holy Spirit power at all. So the anointing is a part of Five promises here from God. Number one, he establishes us. You ever, uh, you ever travel back east in the, north, the northeast where 
there were first colonies and the, you go to these little towns. Maybe you guys have done the, the fall leaves tour and you go to these little towns in what? Connecticut and Rhode Island and Massachusetts and you go to a little town. I mean, it's just like, it's like eight houses there and it says established 1689, right? And you're like, and you, you go, wow, this thing's been around forever. So my established number is 1964. That's when I gave my life to Christ. And from that time, I've been established. I, I can't be unestablished. I've been established. God sets it in stone. Sometimes you'll, you'll see a building, it'll have a cornerstone, right? And it'll say, erected on this date. And you say, oh, it's an old building. And so this is where he's talking about God does the work of establishing. Number two is anointing. That's our Bible study today. So we're established. He anointed us. He established us. He anointed us. So what does anointing mean for you and me that's different than David? Well, you and I, every, every believer is anointed now. Every believer has the power of the Holy Spirit now. Every believer has the blessing of God now. It's not just a king. It's not just a prophet. It's not just a priest. In fact, the New Testament writers are going to say, you are prophets. You are kings. You are priests. In fact, together, Peter says, we're actually a kingdom of priests. That's who we are. Uh, hey, good job with the amen. So, so like here, look, I, I, don't, I don't want to pick on other folks because uh, there's no value in that, but I, but I want you to understand your Bible, right? You don't have to go to somebody else and confess your sins. That's not biblical any longer. Old Testament, yeah, you did. And you had to take a goat and shed his blood. But New Testament, Jesus does the work once and for all. And so we have that anointing on us. That Look at the third promise here. He put his, he put his seal on us. The, in, in the ancient days, uh, a king, a prince, somebody of uh, position and authority would have a signet ring. The signet ring was designed specifically for uh, wax. And you would, you would write a letter. Uh, you would want to send it from one, uh, maybe to a government official, one king to another king. You would want that king to know that it was from you and you would want him to know that it had not been tampered with. And so when the letter was done, it would be put in an envelope or in ancient times it would be rolled and then the wax, hot wax would be melted just sometimes right off a candle. It would be right there, make a pool of it and then you would take your signet ring, the ring that was, there wasn't another ring like it in the world. It was made for you and you would imprint that and that stamp was a stamp of approval. That stamp was a stamp of authority. That stamp was a stamp of power. The Apostle Paul is saying, you and I have been sealed. L later, we can read in, in to, the, to the church at Ephesus, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have, his, we have God's stamp on us. So this is what happens for us. You are made in the image of God creatively, and then you are stamped redemptively. You've been, you've been double stamped, double stamped and sealed. So you're established, you're anointed, you're sealed. He continues, and he says, and God has put his spirit in our hearts. So we have the spirit of God. And that one we're very familiar with. And then the last promise, and all of this is God's guarantee. Okay? Every believer has this. So we do this thing sometimes like, well, I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not Franklin Graham. I'm not like a well-known this or that. I'm just a regular guy. I'm a regular gal. There isn't any such thing in the children of God. Our Father is the King of Kings. We are children of the King. We are established, anointed, sealed, 
indwelled by his spirit, and it's all guaranteed. The guarantee is about your salvation. You remember how I teach you all the time? You can't lose your salvation because God guarantees it. So this is our ceiling. This is the general information of it. But there's another part of it here. Turn with me back to Acts chapter 13. There's a, there's a second, this is, and this is the last thing that we're going to have time to look at. There's a second New Testament teaching here. And I kind of got this too close. So, so this is the first New Testament teaching. That is the general anointing. And there's a second New Testament teaching, which is a specific anointing. And this has to do with spiritual leadership. In Acts chapter 13, it's the story of the church at Antioch. Barnabas has gone there. Barnabas is the lead pastor. Um, <laughs> church is growing so rapidly, he needs another pastor on his staff. He goes in and gets a guy that nobody else will hire to be a pastor. His name is Saul. It turns out later his name is going to be changed to Paul. They, the church at Antioch just blows up. It's growing and growing and growing. It says in chapter 13 of Acts, now there were in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Notice how he's last on the list. When they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of that I have called them to. I want you to see, this is God. This is God saying, I want these two guys. And it's really interesting who he chooses. He chooses the guy whose name is first on the list and the guy whose name is last on the list. So this isn't about uh, performance. This isn't about who's the most brilliant. This isn't about who's the best preacher. This is the work of God. God does this, and they acknowledge it because then after fasting and praying, verse 3, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Look at verse 4, just so there's no mistake. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about a work of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, all this work, this general anointing, that's true of every believer, it's all a work of the Holy Spirit of God. This isn't a work that you do. You don't establish yourself. You don't seal yourself. You can't guarantee yourself. It's all a work of the Holy Spirit of God. So this true is a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the phrase that will throw you, that you say, well, but Paul, the word anointing is not in here. You're exactly right. Because now in the New Testament, there's a new tradition. When we recognize that the Holy Spirit has called someone to spiritual leadership, the new tradition is, here it is in verse 3, they laid their hands on them and they sent them out. And this is about the calling of spiritual leadership. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. You got to go 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is going to be our last verse. We just run out of time. You did great today finding all these passages, looking them up, maybe some, writing yourself a note or two. 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul's writing to his. Uh, younger brother in the faith. And uh, as he writes to Timothy, uh, this is one of the occasions where Paul's in prison, but he wants to encourage Timothy. First Timothy chapter four, he says in verse 11, I want you to command and teach these things. In verse 12, he says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example he gives him a five-fold example. Be an example in speech. Number two, in conduct. Number three, in love. Number four, in faith. Number five, in purity. Thir verse 13, until I come, devote yourselves to the public 
reading of scripture to exhortation and teaching, that's exactly what we are doing right now. We still do this 2,000 years later. You say, well, how do we decide what we do? As Baptists, what we do is what the Bible says to do. So if the Bible doesn't say it, we don't worry about it. For instance, today's Ash Wednesday, right? I, I, got, I got no ash on my forehead. It's, it's not that I'm against that, but it's not found in the Bible. So I don't let traditions take away from what the Bible says. So the Bible says, hey, make sure and devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching, verse 14, and don't neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. This is, this phrase, the lay your hands on, or lay hands on, is the phrase now that becomes an, the, the symbol of anointing. So when we recognize that the Holy Spirit of God calls one from among our midst, and he called them to spiritual leadership, then the elders, notice here it's the council of elders, the elders recognize that. And then the, the laying on of hands, which is sometimes even called ordination, the laying on of hands acknowledges that they have the not just general anointing of God, every believer has that, but they have a specific anointing of God for spiritual leadership. And, and now I, I conclude the whole morning with, and, and this guy right here, the this, this spiritual leader that has the anointing of God, you don't want to harm God's anointed you can't harm God's anointed and be guiltless. Took you full circle, right? Full circle. In fact, they'll say lots of things in the New Testament like, you don't even get to make an accusation against an elder unless you've got two or three witnesses. It's not, and it's, not that, it's not that elders and pastors can't sin. They do, and they, and they sin all the time, and many of them forfeit their spiritual leadership. But it is a different, I have a different calling I have a higher calling. James says, not many of you should aspire to be teachers. It's a higher condemnation. You, you, you don't want it if you're not called. So the Holy Spirit does the calling. The elders do the affirming. They lay hands on. And this is a part of everything that David began to understand in a cave. How cool is that? So once again, it's not the kind of Bible study you get every week. But it's got all these parts to it. Why did David not kill Saul? Because God's in charge of that. And then he realized, wait a second, God's in charge of me. I'm God's anointed. Then he realized God's going to bring in a, an anointed one, the anointed one, that's going to take care of all of this. This is Jesus. Isaiah 61, Luke 4, going to the cross. Now in the New Testament, each of us have the anointing of God and our pastors and elders have a special anointing for leadership. And all of this starts in a cave. So I hope you have a new thought today. Maybe you're like, man, I've studied my Bible a lot. I've never really thought about anointing. Uh, which, by the way, oh, man, I wish I had time for this. I was tell you, you know the story. Jesus goes to the home of uh, uh, Simon, a Pharisee. And, and then a woman comes in and breaks an alabaster jar and she anoints his feet. And Simon thinks, well, if he was a Messiah, he'd know what kind of woman this is. Everybody in town knows what kind of woman this is. He would be, not let her touch his feet. And Jesus says, Simon, can I tell you something? He goes, yeah. And he goes, you know, I came in and you didn't offer me any water to wash my feet. And you didn't offer me any oil for my head. And you didn't even offer me the customary Hebrew kiss on the cheek. But since I came in, she has not stopped anointing me. Do you know what his greatest sin was? It wasn't the kiss or the water or the oil. He didn't acknowledge the anointing of God. Mm -hmm.